الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. The value of time. Time about which the Prophet ﷺ had said, لا تسب الدهر فإن الله هو الدهر. لا تسب الدهر. Do not curse time. فإن الله هو الدهر. The obvious meaning is, for indeed Allah, He is time. As a result of this hadith, some people include a dahar among the names of Allah. But this is a mistake. Because when the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الدَّهَرِ it means he is the khaliq al-dahar. He is the creator of time. Not that he himself is time. This is a metaphorical usage. He is the creator of time. And we know that because in some other narrations, it mentions where Allah says, uqallibu layla wa nahar After saying that he was time, he said, I flip the night and the day. I change the night and the day. So he's clarified what he meant by saying he was time. He is the creator of time. Time is a period in which things occur. It is not itself an actor. It is not a doer. It is a period or point at which something occurs. In our common usage, in English, we have time. We make time. We find time. We save time. We lose time. We buy time. We spend time. We waste time. <laughs> All these things we're doing to time. Time is money. Time flies. Time passes. We have a lifetime. We have a bedtime. We have dinner time. There's all kinds of things about time that we possess, we do with, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the other hand, says, Walasr, by time. In al insan la fi khusr. Indeed, human beings are in a state of loss. All of this time that we had, we lost, we bought, we saved, etc. All of it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we are not able to utilize it as it was meant to be utilized, we are lost. So the time which we have, which has been allotted to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 50,000 years before the creation of this world. That time has particular value to each and every one of us. If we don't use it as it was meant to be used, then it becomes a curse for us. If we use it as it was meant to be used, then it becomes a blessing. That time that we have 
may be spent in three ways. Either in thoughts, in conversations, or in actions. We should strive to make our thoughts good thoughts. But this is an area of challenge because we don't control our thoughts. Some of them we initiate, but then others of them come from other sources. They could come from the people around us. The people slander and whisper things in our ears. Or they could come from satanic sources. The jinn, Satan, whispers. So Allah doesn't hold us accountable for our thoughts, whether good or bad, until those thoughts become conversation or actions. Once we turn them into words, we have now vocalized them, or we act on them, then we become responsible for them. So, the struggle that we have is to try to make our thoughts as much as possible in accordance with Islamic teachings. To do so, it means we should be in contact with the source of the best thoughts. The source of the best thoughts, of course, is none other, none other than the Quran itself. So if we are to have good thoughts, then we need to attach ourselves to the source of the best thoughts, the Qur'an. If we are to have good conversations, again, we should be doing so in accordance with what Islam teaches. And if we don't have good conversations to make, then we should do as the Prophet ﷺ told us, be quiet, be silent. So in that way, we protect our conversations from falling into error being counted against us. And of course, our actions. To establish good actions, then we need to first and foremost establish the good actions which Islam has prescribed. Those good actions begin with declaration of faith, five times daily prayer, fasting in Ramadan, giving zakah, making hajj. All of these are good actions, righteous deeds, obligatory deeds, depending on whether we have the finances or we have the means, etc., which are geared towards developing our own actions. As Allah told us, Inna salah tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Salah prevents evil speech and evil deeds. That is what it's supposed to do. However, for most of us, we make salah and it has no impact at all on our deeds. So when we find in this realm of actions that we are not getting better, we're not becoming better people. Ramadan after Ramadan, no change. In fact, maybe we're getting worse. It means that our salah as a fundamental principle in our lives is not serving the function that it's supposed to, to do. So, the time which our actions are taking, which our actions are consuming, is of no benefit to us. It is harmful to us. So we need to assess and how do we give value to our time? How do we make it? It's valuable already, but how do we give it its proper value? 
by making sure that we get the most out of it. So, salah, for example, which is supposed to prevent us from evil speech, fahsha, wal munkar, and evil deeds, if it is not impacting on us, then it means we are wasting time. We're doing actions which are of no value. We keep doing them over and over and over again, and they're not producing any results. You know, this type of uh, behavior you know, is considered sick. A person who keeps doing the same thing, expecting different results, but they keep getting the same results, and they still keep doing it, this person is considered to have a mental problem. Psychiatrists try to treat such people. So we don't want to be in that category. Uh, we don't do that in other areas of our lives, but we seem to do that very easily with our Islam. We treat our Islam as a cultural habit that we do because our parents do it, our family does it. It's the norm, so we just do it. But that time is wasted time. So we said that in order to build good thoughts, we need to connect to the Quran. In order to build good conversations, we need to also connect to good deeds, guidance, which the Prophet ﷺ has given us, and in our actions, the pillars of Islam and those principles connected to it. In the case of conversations, our conversations should be guided by the principles of our Iman. Actions guided by the principles of our Islam. There is a connection. Prophet Muhammad on one occasion said, Ad dunya mal'una. Mal'unun ma fiha. This world is cursed, and everything in it is cursed. It seems like a very negative look at the world. If you just take, take that statement on face value. Prophet Muhammad is very positive in so many things that he said. So why this negativity? What is he referring to? What makes this world a curse? It becomes cursed when we are addicted to it. Because we have to live in this world. Allah has created us in this world. We're not supposed to run away from the world. Go sit in the top of a mountain somewhere so you don't have to deal with any of the bad things. No, this is not Islam. We don't have monasteries like, you know, where the monks go and they cut themselves off from society. No, this is not the Islamic way. Instead, we just have to be careful in how we use our time. Where we become addicted to the things of this world, then our time is wasted. Our time is consumed in useless matters. Things which are of no benefit. So, the way forward, the Prophet ﷺ went on to say, إِلَّا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ So he didn't just leave us with the cursed world. He said, among the things in this world that are not cursed, that are in fact beneficial, which we, if we engage in it, if we become addicted to it, become attached to it, then it will benefit us, is the remembrance of Allah. إِلَّا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ and whatever helps us to remember Allah. These are two elements which, if engaged in on a regular basis, then our time 
is preserved. Our time becomes valuable. Our time becomes beneficial. Wa'aliman wa muta'allima. The scholar, the teacher, and the student. So, in terms of our goals, what each and every one of us should set for ourselves is to be either a teacher, as Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the ultimate teacher, and or a student. Because this is the blessed relationship in which time is fully valued. We get the maximum out of our time. When we teach, as the Prophet ﷺ had said, خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه The best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it to others. It's that teaching element which makes us the best we can be. So whatever knowledge we are gaining as a student, that's a blessed state to be in. As a student, that is a good use of one's time outside of the remembrance of Allah, then we should be a student, which is why Prophet Muhammad had told us, Talabul ilmi farida ala kulli Muslim. That seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim, so that we would be using our time constructively. So we would be using our time constructively. So if we then utilize our time in study, we are gaining knowledge, we are attaching ourselves first and foremost with Allah. Because when we are told to be a student, the knowledge which is of most importance is the knowledge of Allah. That's where proper knowledge begins. The most valuable knowledge is the knowledge of Allah. The most reliable and truthful knowledge is the knowledge conveyed by revelation. So this is the place to start. We start with revelation, which teaches us primarily about Allah. By knowing Allah, knowing who He is, knowing His attributes, we can then worship Him as He deserves to be worshipped. Then we start to focus on utilizing our time, whatever opportunities we are given, we strive to utilize that time and opportunity in the worship of Allah. We turn whatever we are doing, which may not be in and of itself worship, we turn it into worship by fulfilling whatever conditions are necessary following the way of the Prophet وسلم, in doing it, following his guidance, guidance of Quran, having the right intention, etc., then those acts become acts of worship. So the dunya is only cursed for those people who have missed out on the remembrance of Allah, seeking knowledge, and conveying it. It is cursed for those who don't have that consciousness, who are not engaged in those activities. So if we are to value time, then we have to make sure we're involved in one of these three, if not all of the three. In terms of the ways in which we spend our time, we said it's either time spent in thought, in conversations or actions. That time 
is interrupted at certain points. We cannot control and stop interruptions. We might be thinking deeply, somebody comes, they ask us something, whatever, we have to attend to them. We cannot take out, except by isolating ourselves, we said, and that's not the way to go, putting yourself on the top of the mountain, then you can think all you want to think. That's not the way. The way is still within uh, society. As the Prophet said, المؤمن الذي يخالط الناس ويصبر على أذاهم خير من المؤمن الذي لا يخالط الناس ولا يصبر على أذاهم. The Muslim, the believer, who mixes with the people and bears their harm, is better than the one who doesn't mix with the people and bear their harm. Though in both there is good. There is good in both because once a person is a believer, then there is good in them. However, the better believer, the better way is to be amongst people. Once you're amongst people, then you cannot uh, ensure thought which is uninterrupted by the world in which we live. Similarly, our conversations, while speaking, we get interrupted. And our actions, while doing, we also get interrupted. We're unable to complete actions, etc. But the, un the, the most important thing is not so much to eliminate interruptions, because if interruptions are natural, it's going to happen. Like it, as they say, or lump it. It's going to happen. You cannot guarantee time exclusively for yourself. But what you can do is to control that time which you spend in dealing with those interruptions. You don't let them uh, take over and run away with your time. The interruptions are coming. You can't stop them. But how much do you let them interfere? Some of them are needs which need to be taken care of. Others are wants, or others are yet just diversions. So you control them accordingly. That which is a need, you need to put time to. You have to give more time to it. That which is a want, somebody has a want, this is a person who depends on you, etc. Then you spend some time in providing for their wants. And when it's just a waster, a time waster, it's just eating up your time, time is going with no value, then you try to minimize it. So it means you must prioritize. You have to prioritize and utilize your time effectively. To do so, you must prioritize. Those things which are most important, most urgent, these are the things that you need to be doing regularly, getting them done. In that way, we put value to our time. Those things which are not important, which are not urgent, we should try to avoid them. If they're not important, leave them in the back. If we can drop them all together, we drop them. But if they still do have to be done at some point in time, we need to deal with them. But we leave them at the end of our list. The Prophet ﷺ gave us further guidance with regards to our time. In another hadith in which he said, Ni'matani maghbunun fihima kathirun minan nas. There are two things about which most people are deluded. as wal farag Good health and spare time. Spare time. We think we have time. What that leads to is, of course, procrastination. That's how we are deluded. We're deluded into thinking we have time. Time is ours. We have enough time. We can do it later. 
We can put it off until later. This is a satanic delusion. Satan whispers that into our ears. You don't have to do that now. You can always do it later. There's plenty of time. So what happens in some communities is that when a young person wants to make Hajj, the elders will say to them, no, don't make Hajj now. You're still young. You're still young. Meaning, there's still a lot of sins you're going to end up doing, right? So don't do the Hajj now. Right? Save it until near the end. The latter part of your life. Then you go and make your Hajj and clean up everything. See? So you find communities all over. They discourage young people from making Hajj. Hajj is just for old people. And that's why you see these statistics. People go, every, every year people are going for Hajj, people are dying. Just walking up the plank, getting onto the airplane, people fall, they're dead. Walking off the plane when they hit Jeddah, boom, they're dying. You know, just left and right. Why? Because only old people, mostly, are going to make Hajj. And this is not what Islam prescribed. Islam prescribed that Hajj is supposed to be made once you have the means. You have health, you have means, you're supposed to make Hajj. It is haram for you to delay your Hajj. It has become an obligation once you have the means. So we have to break this pattern. Go against what the elders advise. Because the reality is that if one continues in a sinful life, when the time for Hajj comes, do you think you're going to be able to flip and become an angel during your Hajj? When Allah says, Wala rafatha, wala fusuka, wala jidala fil Hajj, that we're not supposed to be talking bad and arguing and being harsh with people, rough, etc., corruption. Do you think we're going to be able to make it through Hajj that way? Of course not. If you've been living this other kind of life, when you come to make Hajj, it's the same you. You haven't changed. So when you make the Hajj, you will do all the things you're not supposed to do. I was a Hajj guide for about four years, five years from Qatar. And I have seen and heard <laughs> Things which you say, what are you coming here for? Are you coming for Hajj or you're looking for a five star vacation? You know, any little thing going wrong, people were complaining. Even when the Hajj uh, group, you know, gave us uh, sleeping bags. Some people got blue and some people got green. The ones who got green were complaining, why didn't we get blue? The ones who got blue, why couldn't we get green? I say, you're here for Hajj. Leave those things. It's not important. But because of the fact that they were not prepared for Hajj. They were not mentally, spiritually, emotionally prepared for Hajj. They were just rolling into Hajj. And of course... They were doing things. After they did it, they would come and say, Sheikh, are we allowed to do that? You should have asked before. <laughs> you know, don't ask after you've done it. You know? Now what do I have to do? <laughs> this whole approach to Hajj, very, very, very poor. Very sad. So many people destroy their Hajj because they don't prepare for it. In the dunya, we make all our preparations. Whenever we have to do anything, you're going for a vacation, you prepare. You find out all about the place. You're going to, you know, you go on the internet, you find out, you download, you read, you study, you know, to make sure that you have a good time in your vacation. Very careful to make sure things go well. But when it comes to Hajj, it's just, where's the haram? How do you put on the haram? You're putting it on this way, that way, and just get on the plane and you're gone. 
You figure you'll find out along the way. Or you just do what everybody else is doing. And plenty of times everybody else is doing the wrong thing. So you end up just doing the wrong thing along with them. Also, another area, a big area in our lives, where this attitude of time, spare time, we have time, we don't need to do this now, is the area of marriage. Young people, when they reach the age of marriage, parents are saying to them, don't get married now. Wait, finish your studies and wait until you've got a job and you earned enough and you can build this thing and that and yeah, yeah, that's the time. So, that doesn't happen until like your 30s. Right? That may be okay for the men but for the women, it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem. Delaying marriage. And the Prophet Sallallahu told us Ya ma'ashara shabab all young people who are, whoever among you are able should get married. He said, get married young. Get married young. And we delay. So what happens? Those years, which are the most critical years, the years in which hormones are flowing, Desires are strong. We tell them, don't get married. So what happens? People just turn it off and say, okay, turn off the desires, they'll carry on. No. They end up in corruption. Either they're watching, you know, pornographic stuff, which they shouldn't be, watching the channels, etc. Now that these things are all available in the society, or they're engaged, get caught up in masturbation or something like this. You know. Some, whatever, they're going to end up doing things that they don't need to be doing. Things which are harmful to them. Harmful to the society. That's the consequence. Once we delay, it brings in corruption. Worse than that, you end up with lesbianism. Homosexuality gets born out of those circumstances. So the harm is great. We should marry young. We should marry our children young. And just so that you don't think, oh, he's saying that. It's easy for him to say that. No, my son who was 16 years old, I got him married at 16. His wife was 18. They now have six kids, live in Dubai, having a happy life. A good life, inshallah. My other son, who just turned 17, he's going to get married in August, inshallah. His wife is 15. So, it can be done. You know, who am I? You know, I'm a convert Muslim. When I was studying in Medina, I met one brother, Saudi, in Medina. He had gotten married when he was three years old. <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> three years old. Yeah, he got married. His wife was two and he was three. <laughs> yeah not a problem alhamdulillah they're happily married they got a bunch of kids and you know <laughs> sure when the prophet said marry young and have a lot of kids you know you see <laughs> he has all the opportunity I mean you'll be able to to, to play with your great grandchildren you know, you would not be so old, you can't even, you know, you, you're lying on the bed, all you can do is look at them, right? You can actually go and play with them. Your great-grandchildren. Right? So, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm not going to say that you have to go out and do that with your kids now, but I'm just saying that, you know, it works. 
There's no harm in it. In fact, it prevents corruption. It prevents corruption. So, the guideline that we have with regards to spare time, al-faragh, Prophet Muhammad told us to beware of it because it gets abused. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses that spare time saying, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ Once you have finished the time necessary to do one act of worship, you should move on to the next act of worship. In other words, you should be striving to make all of the time of your life, of our life, a time of worship. And that is enshrined in the famous verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Indeed, my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. That is the ultimate goal. That all of our time becomes time for worship. Some of it is time for specified worship, and some of it is time for unspecified worship. But we are engaged in worship all the time. Meaning, we strive to please Allah that whatever we do, regardless of the circumstances, the time frame, etc., we do what is pleasing to Allah. That is the ultimate goal. Why? Because doing what is pleasing to Allah is the essence of worship. What is worship in Islam but doing what is pleasing to Allah? That is the essence of it. And we have been created utilizing and given this act of worship as our way that we can utilize to get to the ultimate goal of our creation, which is to enjoy the bliss of paradise. This is the goal. This is what we were created for. Allah didn't create us for hell. But he gave us a choice. He created us for paradise. Every single human being created was created for paradise. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said. For every human being, the place in paradise for which they were created is there. There's a place in paradise for every last human being. However, we were given the choice of whether we want to go there or not. So for that choice to be meaningful, there had to be hell. Hell was created for the choice, for the purpose of the choice. And, of course, it meant also that in hell there is a place for everyone. If everybody decided they want to go to hell, there is a place already created for them. But ultimately, Allah created us for paradise. Important for us to understand this principle because there are people who will raise this issue. Oh, you say your God is a merciful God, so why does he put people in hell? You know, to understand that mercy which is not tempered by justice becomes wrong, becomes evil, becomes harmful, unfair, unjust. All of the negative terms happens once mercy is no longer just. It's not tempered by justice. So, if we go back to our original premise, the value of time. Each and every one of us 
has been given a fixed amount of time. We don't know how long it is. Some of us may walk from this auditorium and die on our way home. Or go to sleep tonight and not wake up tomorrow. That is the reality. It is happening all around us. We don't have knowledge of how much time we have. There is a set amount. We don't know when it runs out. So what can we do? It means then that we have to focus on the time that we do have, which is now. What is available to us now, we need to focus on it and make sure we are getting the maximum we can out of it. To use it, to utilize it, to benefit from it in the best way that we can. If we're able to do that, we will be successful. If we're unable to do that, we will fail. It's very simple. So, when we leave here tonight, at least take away with you this reminder. The reminder concerning the value we place on our time. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the wisdom and the commitment to utilize our time as it deserves to be utilized, to make the best of it, to spend it wisely, to use it wisely. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the evils of procrastination, of being deluded, as the Prophet sallallahu warned us, being deluded by the forces of evil into thinking that we have lots of time, we have spare time, we have time to kill, as they say. We don't. Barakallah fikum, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam alaikum. Anyone, uh, those who have questions, may I ask him now from brothers and sisters? So, the, uh, the, sis uh, the sister side have a question. Could you please comment on how important it is to balance and acquire both the worldly education and Islamic education and not leave either so as to you can set an example of a true Muslim in short for dawah purposes and at the same time work towards benefiting the ummah for the sake of Allah? Well, as I said earlier that seeking knowledge as the Prophet ﷺ informed us, is obligatory on every Muslim. That knowledge, we said, began with the knowledge of Allah. That's most important. This is what we call fard ayn, knowledge which is an individual obligation on every Muslim. We also have fard kifaya, knowledge which is necessary for the community to function. We need people who have these skills to build buildings, to uh, do operations, to teach all the different skills which are necessary for a community to function effectively. We must have people with this knowledge. So we are then encouraged to go and get knowledge of what we may call the dunya, knowledge of the dunya in order that we benefit our community, our community grows and in fact benefits the world. The Prophet ﷺ had said, 
khairun nas anfa'uhum lin nas the best of people are those most beneficial to the masses of the people so we should have this care this concern to be beneficial to add value to give of our time to the community whatever field we might be in on one hand we should make sure that that field in fact does not harm the society that we are actually benefiting the society in our business our work etc secondly we should also take from the time that we have what we called our spare time some of that should be used to voluntarily serve the community this becomes like it's the, the zakah of your profession whatever field you're in the zakah of it we have zakah of the mal of the of the wealth that is there but the zakah of the knowledge is <coughs> given when we take from our time and we voluntarily pass it on to others so education in both areas education knowledge of the deen is critical each and every one of us has to learn as much as is necessary to function properly in our given circumstance you don't need to learn about hajj if you are not planning to make hajj you don't have the means there's no way you don't have to go studying hajj you should know hajj of course in general but to go study all the details and to be unless you're going to be a teacher that's not for you what you need to focus on is the area you're working in having sufficient knowledge to do that particular working area properly islamically so we need to have people with what they may call worldly skills as well as knowledge of the deen in order to have that balance which i talked about earlier in the previous lecture that we are as allah said wa kadhalika ja'alnakum ummatan wasata in that way we have made you a balanced nation all members are balanced we're not into deen so much that we ignore the dunya nor are we into the dunya so much that we ignore the deen but we try to find the balance between the two and serve allah and serve humanity at the same time the next question is uh, from the brother side what immediate steps can a person who is a serial procrastinator take from a spiritual and temporal point of view what can a serial procrastinator take from take from a spiritual and a temporal point of view i mean what cure uh, he, uh, you can maybe you repeat the question maybe no, you know? you've, you've exposed otherwise i'll the be in trouble now, please <laughs> can they do yeah in other words yeah what can a serial procrastinator meaning uh, somebody who is addicted to procrastination it is just their way what can they do to cure or to tackle or to treat this ailment well for one i would say you need to have a good friend who is the complete opposite right if your good friends are all serial procrastinators like yourself there is no hope you're lost that's the point you have to have somebody around who is consistent getting things done who's going to be reminding you encouraging you etc this is you need that contact you need that support also in terms of your activities if you 
delineate what you have to do in some kind of a diary or whatever, you know, you have a, a plan where you can actually see things because oftentimes we procrastinate when we say, okay, I have this to do, but we don't write it down anywhere to remind ourselves, right? We just have the thought. And of course, you can forget the thought. Do you remember two days that, oh yeah, I had to do this thing, you know? That becomes your means of procrastination, that support for your procrastination. So if you are writing things down, you have a whiteboard, you know, before you leave the house, you have written on there all the things you need to do today. You know, as a reminder, maybe you want to get to work, you've got yellow stick it on your uh, table. You have to do these things. You need to put them in different places, reminding yourself constantly that you have to get these things done. Tick them off as you do them. You know? So these are, we have these modern means. We have uh, watches now and, and the mobiles where you can program in things. The bell rings, you know, whatever. Oh, right, I have to do this. Okay. These are all things that will remind us. So we can utilize this technology to help us. But even more important, as I said, is to have a good friend who does things on time. So. Uh, I think it's from the sister side. Uh, you said our prayers today don't change us. How can we correct our prayers to rectify this, to make sure our prayers change us like they should? Again? Uh, you said our prayers today don't our, change us. Our who? You said our prayers don't change us. Our prayers? The, uh, the prayers. Prayers don't change Parents. us. Parents. Prayers. Salat. Salat. Prayers. Salat. Okay. Salat. Sorry okay. for my... Sorry. Salat don't change us. Uh, how can we correct our Salat to rectify this, to make sure our Salat change us they, like they should? Okay. If we recognize that our prayers have no effect on us, mm -hmm. then it means that we're not doing the prayers which were prescribed. We're doing our version. Perhaps that's the one that we were taught. Like the guy who came in the masjid, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is sitting with his companions, he comes in, he makes his two rakah, he comes over to sit down. Before he can sit down, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, Go back and pray because you didn't pray. So he went back. He prayed. Came back again. Before he could sit down, the Prophet said, go back and pray because you didn't pray. He went back and he did the prayer again. Came to sit down, Prophet said, go back. He said, oh, yeah, Rasulullah, I don't know any other prayer than that. Please tell me what am I supposed to be doing. So now then the Prophet corrected him. He told him what needs to be done. Because he was making that 90 miles an hour salah, the one where you stand up and by the time you say Allahu Akbar, you're going into rukur. As soon as you finish saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you're going down into rukur. You say, how did you say Fatiha in between that? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of fatiha was that? How long do you I mean? It's become habit now. We don't realize what we're doing. So it means we have to go back and tackle these various steps in the prayer. As the Prophet said, to stand until your back, all the bones fall into place. When you bow, you bow again until all the bones fall into place, stand back up, make the duas, make the prayer, as the Prophet Sallallahu had said, Sallu Salata Muadda'in, that you should make a farewell prayer. If somebody told you that this is the last prayer before you die, that prayer that you're going to make now 
is the prayer that we need to be making all the time. That is the goal, to make that farewell prayer. And if we think, keep that in mind, keep that as our goal all the time. Check ourselves. Make sure each element of the prayer follows that. Then, inshallah, we can make a prayer which will change our lives. Also, just a, a point of reference, we make wudu before the prayer. Wudu is preparation for the prayer. We tend to think that that preparation is just a physical washing. You just wash the dirt, you had dirty hands, whatever, you know, maybe food left over from eating, washing it off your face. But actually the Prophet ﷺ told us that the prayer is not merely a physical cleaning. It is. The element is there, but that's not the primary element. Because he said that with every drop of water which falls from our bodies, our limbs, that we wash when we're making wudu, our sins drop off with it. Our sins. Is that a physical thing on our bodies? No. So we're talking about spiritual cleanliness. Now if some individual, and you do have individuals out there who claim to have certain spiritual qualities and position, peer, so and so, or sheikh, maulana, whatever, who tells you, I can see the sins that are dropping off your body parts know that you must run away from this man the way you run away from a lion. Danger. That is the red flag. Danger. It's a pure, it is a spiritual purification. So as the Prophet ﷺ had said, when you wash your hands, you are washing your hands of the sins that your hands have committed. So that should be in your mind. When he's telling us that, that's what he's telling us. That we should be conscious that in this physical washing of our hands, we are washing our hands of the sins that our hands have committed. When we're washing our face, the sins that our mouths have said, our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and so on and so forth. Our feet, where our feet have taken us to. All of this is fundamentally spiritual purification. And that's why when we're finished, we say what? Allahumma ja'alna minat tawwabin wa ja'alna minat mutatahirin. Oh Allah, make us amongst those who purify our, uh, who uh, constantly repent and those who purify themselves. So this act of wudu is actually an act of repentance that we repent before we engage in Salah. We come into Salah with an attitude, a repentant attitude. We have purified ourselves. We have sought to purify ourselves. So when you come into Salah with that type of attitude, obviously your approach to Salah is going to be much different from what we're doing now. Where we run into the prayer, we are watching cricket. And this is the break between, for the commercials. So we run quickly, we're praying. And, of course, as soon as you stand up, your head is just filled with the cricket game and how this guy bowled and how this guy scored or whatever and this and the other. And you end up with your prayer saying, wow, I can't, you know, my mind is just so confused, so much thoughts coming. Why? What do I need to do? How can I pray properly? Well, you can't because you, your wudu wasn't preparation. Your prayer, you've not, you've not had that preparation for the prayer. So naturally, you go into the prayer, you take with you whatever you were doing before the prayer. This is reality. 
So we have to, for that prayer to have the kind of impact, we need to prepare ourselves properly with the proper kind of wudu. And then we prepare, then we make the prayer in a f way in which we are reflecting on what we're saying, we are praying in a slow, deliberate way. This is the prayer which was prescribed. Uh, Sheikh, we'll take one, one more last question. Okay. Uh, if you can explain about barakah of time, and I'm trying to lead my life and time effectively, but I still feel there's no enough time in a day. Come again? I still feel no, no, that the there's beginning. not enough time in a day. Uh, if you can explain about barakah of time. Barakah of time. Well, the barakah of time is that when we utilize the time, we are blessed. We are blessed in it. We are blessed in it. We gain the barakah of the time when we do what is pleasing to Allah. It's as simple as that. If we think we don't have time, then we need to list the things that we do in a day. You just take a few days. Each day, just list what you are doing. Actually, from the first listing, you will know where you're wasting time. Because for sure, you're wasting time. Nobody has no time. There's no such thing. People only say that. They waste their times in different ways, and then they claim they have no time. So, by assessing our day, we can identify where time is being wasted and we can put that time to good use. Barakallah fikum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh.